Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Bill Burnett. I've had tons of amazing guests on this show, well over 100 now, billionaires, astronauts, professional athletes, world-renowned entrepreneurs, and they've shared their insider secrets for success. They've offered everything from top book recommendations to success hacks to action items that you can use today to see results immediately. If you're like me, you love this kind of stuff. And if you're like me, you want to get the cliff notes, or I guess these days they call them the spark notes. Well, you can get access to the action plans from your favorite guests, like Spartan Race founder Joe DeSena from episode 27, or Navy SEAL Mark Devine from episode 45, or maybe fitness guru Tony Horton from episode 85, plus other amazing tips and tactics to help you Get clear on how to get from where you're at to where you want to be. I put all this in one place because you're busy and you want to get what you need quickly so you can move on with your day. Here's what I want you to do. Go to jimharshawjr.com slash action to get instant access to everything I just talked about. That's jimharshawjr.com slash action action. And if you're listening to this on iTunes, there are three dots on your screen. Just touch the three dots, select view full description. There you'll see the link to download all the incredible resources and action plans that I just mentioned. Now for today's guest. After years of drawing cars and airplanes under his grandmother's sewing machine, Bill went off to Stanford and discovered that there were people in the world who actually did this kind of thing every day, only without the sewing machine. And they were called designers. Bill is the executive director of the design program at Stanford. He got his BS and MS in product design at Stanford and has worked professionally on a wide variety of projects ranging from the award-winning Apple PowerBooks to the original Star Wars action figures, which I played with years ago. He holds a number of mechanical and design patents and design awards for a variety of products, including the first Slate computer. In addition to his duties at Stanford, he advises several internet startup companies. And for the listener, as usual, if you don't have time to listen to the entire episode or if you hear something you like but you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you grab your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jim. It's nice to be here. Well, you know, I, I, I mentioned to you off air that uh, that my mentor and a good friend, Dr. Tom Perrin, had recommended your book to me, Designing Your Life. And uh, it was just a, it's just a fascinating read and a great resource. I recommend it to anybody and everybody. And I, I will have a link to that in the action plan for the listener. But, Bill, your Thank background you. is in design thinking. So let's just start with that from there. What, what is design thinking? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, this is the program I went to when I was a, a, a young college uh, kid. And um, there's a really, really amazing guy here well, years ago, a guy named Bob McKim, who said, um, hey, listen, let's take some let's get the engineers. But why don't we teach them some psychology so that they understand people? Because otherwise they'll design, you know, products that people people can't use. And, and maybe we should care about aesthetics because we build the built world and the built world should be beautiful. And he put together this very interesting program that starts with like a deep dive into human needs. Uh, we teach our students ethnography, we teach them psychology, and then we teach them how to actually build you know, products and stuff. And when I did the program, it was mostly coming up with innovative product ideas. And nowadays, um, you know, we apply it to services and designing, designing experiences, designing financial um, services, all sorts of things, you know, web-based, digital, and physical products. So it's this methodology of using what we call human-centered design, starting with people and empathy for their situation, to come up with, you know, uh, new-to-the-world, innovative products, services, and ideas. 
and it's and it's a it's a really powerful way of of solving problems and it's a little different than the way other schools think of design a lot a lot of design schools really are you know kind of they're in the art department and they and it's the idea of designing you know graphic designer or or interior designer something like that it's the craft of design very important stuff ours is a little more on the methodology of design and um and you know lots of companies use this methodology and we teach it we teach i teach executive classes so that you know execs can come and learn it um and it's turned out to be one of the kind of new uh, new trends or new new um ideas in innovation and all companies are kind of struggling to be more innovative so this is how they how they, they learn our methodology and apply it and it's been very successful and it's a fascinating process for the for the listener to the that wants to learn more about it. I mean, definitely look into it. But Bill, you somehow made the leap from and can you can you tell this to me and the, and the listener how you made the leap from designing stuff, right? Like the Star Wars action figures that I played with when right. I was a kid. And if you, anybody goes to Bill's website, which is billburnett.net, and you've got a, just an amazing list of patents and patent pendings on all kinds of a variety of different projects. So how do you go from yeah. there to designing people's lives? And how, how did you make that leap from applying that to stuff to, to people's lives? Yeah. You know, it's, it, it, it was kind of an accident in, in some ways, but you know, I've been, um, uh, even when I, I've been here full time now as the executive director about 11 years, but before that I used to just, when I was working at Apple and I was working at the toy companies and stuff, I would just come in and teach one class cause we like to have practitioners, you know, teach design, um, and I bring, you know, some of the best designers in from all over the Bay Area to teach with us. But I was so I was teaching. I was having lots of office hours and the students were, you know, kind of they're wonderful students, but they, they don't know much about life. And they they're really worried about, you know, launching out of college and getting their first job or launching out of graduate school and getting a job. And so I was having the same. It seemed like I was having the same office hours, kind of a groundhog day over and over again. <laughs> hey, what do I want to do with my life? Well, why don't you try prototyping something? Why don't you try, you know going out and talking to people. Um, and so after a while, <laughs> I got my friend Dave Evans, who's a co-author of the book and co- co-founder of the Life Design Lab. I said, let's, let's, just go, let's just have office hours with these kids together. Let's get them all together. And we started doing these Friday afternoons with, you know, to have a beer with Bill and Dave and talk about life. Um, and that turned into a couple of little exercises, which then turned into, you know, kind of a prototype class. And we prototyped it two or three times. And then all of a sudden we had a waiting, you know, we were all of a sudden we went from six kids to 20 kids to 60 kids and a waiting list of 60 more that wanted to get in the class. And we thought, oh, wow, we might be onto something here. So but it turns out that, you know, design thinking is a method for solving problems where, you know, the solution's ambiguous. You can't get a lot of data about it because it's in the future. And so we, you know, we evolved this methodology of, of probing the you know probing the need really carefully with the tools of ethnography and then trying to match you know solutions by generating lots of lots of brainstorming lots of mind mapping lots of solution generation activities but the only, but the real way is you prototype and test the answer is in the future right so you, but you can't get any data about the future so you build something and you show it to users and say is this what you wanted and they say no that's not it or oh now that i see that i have a different idea and you just keep doing this process to sort of discover and create the future well it seemed to us like well look the future of my life is uncertain i don't know what exactly what i want to do next i might have two or three or ideas or i may have no ideas but how would i discover what the future of me is going to be uh, if I try to engineer it, it won't work because no plan that I come up with is going to survive, you know, the, the real world because things are going to be different than I expected. And so it seemed it's, we were able to find an analogy for every step of the design thinking process for products in, in, in the design thinking of life, life design. So, you know, I need empathy for myself. What do I want to do for empathy for the world? What's the world need? You know, there's a there's an old expression Dave uses when, you know, my greatest passion meets the world's really felt need. Then we have a, we have a match. Right. But just because I want to do something doesn't mean the world needs it or people will pay me for it or or anything else. So there's this idea of prototyping your way into the future, which, you know, if you when in, in the book, the two things that people come back and say, they go the the that they say are useful. They say, wow, this idea of reframing problems, you know, designers are really good at coming up with 
what's the real problem here? Most of the time when I've been a consultant, people, you know, the, the client has a problem, but really they've got the wrong problem. They're not looking at it properly. And you have to reset, reframe, you know, the, the problem statement. People go, wow, that's really big. Cause I, I realized I was framing my future, you know, around some things that actually didn't even matter to me. And when I, you know, use some of the ideas in your book, the Odyssey plans and stuff, I got a completely different point of view about my future. And then the idea that you can try stuff Dave and I have a mantra, set the bar low, hmm. try stuff, learn from your success or your failure. Everything is a learning, right? There's no such thing as fate on that. You can, you, a lot of times you build prototypes and they fail, sure. but, but, but the process of failure is, as, as you pointed out in your, in your, your Ted talk, the process of failure is exactly how you learn. Um, but that's different than saying, okay, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to, you know, open a restaurant. We have an example of someone in the book that did that. It's like, no, that's not a prototype. That's that's going all in and risking everything. So reframing and prototyping are the two pieces of design thinking that we pulled into life design. And, and, it, and it, it works great. And it lowers people's anxieties about trying to, you know, pr- trying to guess what they want to do. And instead gives them a set of tools where they can just, you know, uh, talk to people, try different, you know, small prototypes and really kind of figure out who they want to be in their in their future rather than than try to guess if i'm a listener and i'm hearing all this and i'm saying yeah i I would like to prototype i would like to i've got these all these different ideas and these i visions for my life and i don't want to make the wrong decision what would be some examples of how i might prototype how do i go about prototyping these different potential futures that i might have for myself yeah. Well, first of all, if you, if you are that person and you think, hey, I've got lots of different futures, you're already on the right track. One of the things that we run into is lots of people have the, what, what psychologists call, and we call in the book, dysfunctional beliefs. It's something that you think is true, but it isn't really true, but it's holding you back. And one of the big dysfunctional beliefs is there's just one best version of my life and I've got to find it. And if I don't find the one best version, I'm kind of settling for for something less than perfect. And then I, but I never can quite attain perfect. So I'm sort of stuck, right? I'm stuck in this. There's one best life. So if you're the person you just described, you say, look, I've got two or three plans for what comes next that I'm really excited about. That's a great place to start. We have everybody do three, what we call odyssey plans, three ideations, three, you know, visions of what might be your future. So if you got those and you, and you want a prototype, we talk about, there's lots of ways to prototype, but two really powerful ones is a prototype conversation and a prototype experience. So a prototype conversation, or people might call it an information interview, is, uh, is, uh, is what we call a little piece of time travel, right? There's someone in the, let's say you, you say, hey, I really want to do this, you know, this blogging thing. And I want, or I, want to have a, I want to have a show on YouTube um, and maybe do TED Talks like, like Jim. I wonder what that's like. Then you go, okay, who do I know in my network? Who's already living that life? Literally, they are a version of me, in the, a, a potential version of me in the future. And instead of asking them, you know, you know, hey, can you give me a job, or hey, can I work on your show with you? You just go, you just go talk to people and get their stories. You get curious about something in your life, and you go talk to people. And our, our, you know, our data is like seventy percent of the time. If you just say to somebody, hey, I, I you know, I, I saw something you did on the on the web. I saw your TED talk. I'm really curious about um, something that you mentioned in your talk. Could I get 30 minutes of your time? I'll buy you a cup of coffee or do it online, however what works for you. A lot of times, you know, 70% of the time people say, sure, I'm happy to talk about that because it's the thing they're passionate about, right? So yeah. It's a job or their work or their thing. So getting these prototype conversations going gives you, gives you two things. It gives you, wow, that was an interesting story. And I'm really now I'm curious about this this other stuff because curiosity is one of our big designer mindsets, and that kind of that kind of energy leads you into the next thing in your future. And the other thing you get is it's this it, you're really not when you're talking to somebody about their story you're also you're also maybe hearing your story in them. You know what I mean? Like if if something they're saying and and you kind of feel in your body or your brain kind of lights up and you get really excited or really curious about it that's that's a that's a that's a a, a really good sign that this might be 
something that would excite you if you were doing it as well in the future. And, and you can also have the opposite experience of going like, wow, that was nothing like what I expected. And I thought it was really boring or really not interesting to me. So a prototype conversation, super powerful. Uh, we make all of our students as one of the assignments, do it three or four times just so they get over the fear of just, you know, asking for the conversation. And then a prototype experience, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of neuroscience data that says, a lot of what we know, we know because of feelings in our body, not so much, you know, thoughts in our head, but feelings. Um, and, it, and it's actually true that gut feelings are real things and, and that you have a, you right. have, a, a, you know, a, a, what uh, Dan Goldman calls the wisdom of the emotions. Yeah, the there's emotions. a neurological connection there. Yeah. So, uh, the, for instance, I, in, I was working with one woman and one of her Odyssey plans required her to go to back to college. And she's in, you know, late 40s. And she goes, I don't know if I want to go back to college. I mean, I don't even know if I want to do that. I don't even know if I can anymore. I don't think I'm, I'm disciplined enough to, you know, to, to go back to, to, you know, get a master's. And then there's all these millennials and they, and they, they hate old people and it's just going to be a terrible experience. <laughs> and I said, funny, and that's ridiculous. You, you're making, you're making up, you're, you're prejudging the experience before you've had it. I said, go get yourself a Stanford t-shirt and here's two classes. You're just going to walk in and sit down and pretend you're a student. Trust me, if you've got a Stanford t-shirt on, no one's going to ask any questions. There are no guards at any of the doors, you know, so just for your, for your readers, uh, uh, information, <laughs> you can walk into any class, you know, at the university or pretty much any university if you got right. a t-shirt. I said, so go to these two classes, come back and tell me what you think. And she went and she said, wow, you know what? I walked into the classroom and my body was alive. And the guy was, I sent it to a, a computer science lecture. She said, I don't even know what he was talking about, but boy, it was interesting. And I started to follow it and that was cool. And then, you know, these millennials, it turned out, they were really curious and really, really kind. They said, what are you doing here? You're so, this is so interesting. You know, you're, you don't look like us. You seem older. And, and I set up three prototype conversations with them to find out what they're excited about. And she said the whole felt experience of being back in school felt felt right to me. Hmm. So these these prototypes are all about getting data on what might, you know, might work for you. And in that case, she came back and said, I, I, you know, I really think school is going to be exciting. And she did end up going back and getting a master's or is in the middle of getting a master's. So that's too simple. Like, yep. Go talk to people, get curious about something you're interested in, go talk to people. And then the prototyping is the try stuff part. Let's now let's go sit in a classroom and see how that works. Or let's go shadow somebody who's doing what we want to do for a day. Or let's go propose somebody. Hey, Jim, I bet you would you could use some help. Would you like someone to, you know, be a ghostwriter for you for a couple of weeks? Because I've always wondered what it'd be like to, you know, have to write on a deadline. And you go, sure, I'll take the free help. Um, you know, so you can always invent projects or experiences that allow you to get a little sample of the future. And that's a great way to kind of sneak up on on something that you might might be excited about and 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 be prepared, you know, for, quote, failure, for discovering that, oh, that version of the future that I thought was going to be so cool when you actually get there, it's not a good fit for me at all. Might be good fit for other people and not for me, but boy, to get that information, that data early in your search is so useful because it, it helps you direct, you know, what what's what's the of the two or three or four outcomes that you might get excited about. Which one is the one that is the best fit? One of the things you mentioned, Bill, was getting together with people. You know, talking to people who have experienced or are experiencing what what you want to do. And I think, I don't know if it was in your book or in your, your own TEDx talk where you talked about radical collaboration. Right. What is radical collaboration? Um, you know, well, it's, 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 um, it's collaboration in the world because the answers, the, the stuff you want to do is in the world, right? It's not, it's not in your head. I, I mean, I, my students and even, you know, we, we're doing workshops now with 30 and 40 something year olds and we're doing workshops inside companies with people trying to figure out how to have a how to plan their you know, best career at company X, Y, or F, or G. Um, and, and so many people just sort of sit and try to think their way, think their way to the future. It's like, well, you don't have any data, and you're just sort of thinking. And, and although you may be a smart person, I don't know how you solve a problem if you're not out in the world where the other people are. 
So radical collaboration in design teams is don't just have designers, bring in the sales team, bring in somebody from manufacturing, bring in somebody from accounting. They're, they don't, they, they, they're not designers, but they have input. And, and when lots of people with different points of view get together, the brainstorming and the idea generation is much richer. So in life design, it's the same thing. Get out in the world and talk to people who aren't like you. Put together you know, your little design advisory team of folks that you can check in with. But make sure they're all coming from a different perspective. When we teach a class at the D school, by the way, um, we, we require all classes to have at least two professors and they have to come from two different schools, a designer and an economist or a designer and a business person or a business person, you know, and a, um, a psychologist, because it's that that mixture of different, really, you know, strong domain expert knowledge kind of colliding together is what makes the possibility of coming up with something, you know, radically new um, that nobody's thought about before. Because if you just get a bunch of people together that are just like you, you're probably going to get answers that are the kind of answers you're, you're not, you're, you're kind of stuck on already. You're not, they're not interesting. I often mention the, the row quote, the masses of men lead lives of quiet desperation. You yeah. know, there's a lot of folks who are stuck but they don't really know that they're stuck or they don't just think they just think that there's not a problem and they just are kind of unsatisfied. Uh, I, is this what you call gravity problems? And can you talk a little bit about gravity problems? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's similar. I think um, we talk about gravity problems, and anchor problems and, and getting stuck a lot, um, both in the book and in the workshops. Our, when, when we went out in the world and we were talking to students and we we're talking to other people, the number one thing we found was that people were stuck. They, they were like, I don't know what to do. I'm not happy. I'm not exactly sure why, right? This is that, that same, that sense, like, you know, I am, I am, you know, living a life of quiet desperation, but I'm not really sure what's wrong. I just know that it's not, I'm not engaged. I'm not fulfilled. You know, there's a Gallup poll they do every year about, you know, engagement at, at work. How many people, how many employees are really engaged in the thing they do? You know, and the, the stats are pretty bad, anywhere from, you know, 40 to 70 percent of U.S. workers are disengaged at work. They don't really care about their job and they're stuck and they don't know what to do about it. So the so like step one is, well, identify this feeling. What, what and a lot of times stuck just feels like numb, like I have no feelings. I'm not happy. I'm not sad. I just I'm just bored, you know, or, or numb. So part of. Part of our process is, well, let's, first of all, we have a, if you take the cover, uh, you know, the dust cover off the book, there's a little Easter egg on the front where we embossed the symbol that we have over our studio, which is the you are here symbol. So first of all, you start where you are. Okay, where are you? Well, I'm stuck. Why? I don't really know. Oh, okay. Well, let's, let's, let's go from there, right? Like, what can, what can we do? What, so what's our first process? Well, it's discovery. What's, what am I stuck on? I, you know, I've got, I got to start identifying these, these points of friction or these dysfunctional beliefs, otherwise I can't move forward. Um, you know, and it, it's really interesting because people, uh, I've, I've met people who are, you know, senior partners at the big law firm in Manhattan and they're stuck and they hate their job. And we've met, you know, um, I'm an hourly worker at the McDonald's and they're stuck and they hate their job. And everybody thinks there's nothing they can do. Um, and, and then once you get them started, you say, well, why don't we try Let's get curious about something. What, you, what, what might you like to do if you weren't doing this? Okay, let's go talk to somebody about that. Okay, let's do that loop three or four times. Okay, now let's think about something you could prototype. Um, so, it, you know, the, the, the method is very empirical. It's very, you know, again, set the bar low. Try, you know, you know, I'm working at the McDonald's, but I'm thinking, wow, it would be better to have maybe a job where I wasn't around all this smelly food all the time. But I like working with people. Um, gee, maybe I could work at a hotel. Well, you can get an associate's degree in hotel management in about two years, and then you can move out of the, you know, out of the frying pan in the back of the McDonald's to a nice front desk job at a hotel, and from there you can move on. You know, it's like you can start imagining futures um, that are really pretty available. They, it just takes a little bit of you know, jogging you out of some dysfunctional beliefs and giving you some options to try things. And most of our, 
you know, the, the, every chapter's got a little some a little tool or something you can use, and none of them take longer than fifteen or twenty minutes, you know, to really do. And all of them, if you do them over and over again, get better and better. So we were trying to make it really easy, uh, not 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 easy. Like some of the things really do take some some commitment, but making it accessible for people that they could do this stuff. They didn't need any special equipment or any, you know, any, and they, uh, when, when we first did the book and the, uh, the, our publishers who are wonderful said, this is going to be in the self-help category. I said, Oh, I don't like self-help books. You know, they, I think they're all, they're all bad. And we did a bunch of research and a lot of self-help books have got some simplified formula, you know, three steps to happiness or something. Well, life isn't that simple right. or, you know, here's, you know, we're going to do some kind of assessment and we're going to figure out, you know, who you are and what, what things match. It's like, okay, I'm an INTJ on Myers-Briggs and my spirit animal is a wolf. <laughs> what the hell do I do with that? Right. I mean, I don't, right. that doesn't, that doesn't make me feel any more like I'm on a good path. Right. Than, There's no clarity there. Yeah. Or you get the sort of, you know, be your best self, be amazing, you know, super motivated. Right stuff and it's like oh god that sounds so tiring to me <laughs> i don't think i can be tony robbins every day right um, i don't even think tony robbins can be tony robbins every day exactly yeah so you know we just wanted to pick things that were were we knew would work because we tested them hundreds and hundreds of times you know with our students and also things that were were doable um and uh, and the one nice comment we get back from people who you know, work through this stuff in the book, say, hey, you know, this is actually pretty doable. It was, it was doable. It was pretty helpful. And it, you don't have to do everything in a book. You can just pick the stuff that's useful and, you know, work on that. Is this only for 20-somethings or recent college grads? Or does this apply to people in midlife or retirees or et cetera? Yeah, well, you know, we we um, we started here, you know, with with twenty somethings. Um, uh, when we first started about seven eight years ago, they were all millennials. Now they're kind of, I guess, Gen Zers. But we very quickly we're working with mid career folks in their thirties and forties, and also people in what they call encore career um, groups, or people who are, you know, had a good career and they've retired. And actually, retiring earlier is happening more and more now, um, and people are leaving what what um psychologists call the money making side of their life and turning into the meaning making side they they you know, they retired in their 50s or early 60s they still got 10 or 20 years of of you know productive life in them and they want to do something more meaningful and so they they're working for nonprofits and they're working you know in the boys and girls clubs and things like that so we we worked with all of these groups and um and it's interesting that one of the very first book things we did was a Stanford alumni group in New York in New York City, um, um, 600 people at the, you know, the Marriott Ballroom off of Times Square, and sitting right in front at the at the first table came early, was this very nicely dressed uh, older woman, and it turned out she her name I'll, I'll call her Ruth, and she was the, from the class of 1950. She was 83 or 84 years old. Wow. And when we got to the part of designing three lives and kind of we do we do these these talks as little workshops. We don't lecture because we don't lecture in the class. Um, she raised her hand and Dave went over thinking, well, she's 84. This probably doesn't apply. She doesn't have three things she wants to do next. And um, but her she she raised her hand and Dave went over and her request was, she says, look, you've given me this sheet. It only has three things on it. Uh, three spaces to fill out plants. I've got about six or seven different plants. Can I have another sheet, please? <laughs> 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 so look, every, we've never, we've not met anyone who doesn't think the rest of their life is going to be interesting or at least worth designing. And uh, it doesn't seem to matter what age you're at. Now, I mean, there are these obvious transition points, right? The high school to college transition point, college to the world or, or college, you know, graduate school to the world. Seems like somewhere in the mid 30s, 40s, you start to look at that first career and it's either working, but you want to accelerate or it's not exactly, you know, what you wanted and you want to pivot. That's they call it a midlife crisis. Could be a midlife, you know, it could be the midlife crisis. Yeah. Um, uh, this is the, you know, the other, you know, quote, um, the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah. I got to tell you, in a lot of these you know, workshops and book talks and things, the people who come up and say they're the most stuck. And who are really, really in, in some pain. You know, like, I'm really unhappy. One woman said, I go to work every day. It steals a little piece of my soul. Um, they're, they're people who are highly successful. You know, 
um, got into the, the, the prestigious college, went to the prestigious law school or business school or whatever, got the, got the job, partner at the firm, making lots of money, you know, hit about 40, 45. And they realize I don't want to do any of this. This was just a, you know, I got, I got hooked on the, I want to get the hard thing. I got into the hard college and I got into the best graduate school. Then I got into the best, you know, law firm or business firm. And then I be, and then I was the first youngest person to make partner, but whatever the, whatever the ladder of little, you know, uh, gold, gold rings were, they grab the gold ring every time and they get to the top of the ladder and they realize, I don't want to do any of this. <laughs> this is, yeah. this is, there's nothing to do with, you know, what I want. And now then, and they report themselves as stuck because they say, you know, you don't understand, Bill. I'm, uh, there's nothing I can do. I go, well, you've got money. You've got, you know, you've got money, social position, all sorts of things. They go, no, no, no. All my friends tell me I should be so happy. I'm so lucky. I have everything. I can't walk away from that. And I'm like, what, why? And I think it's because they never asked themselves at 20 or 18 or whenever you kind of decide to, you know, get honest with yourself, you know, to, to, to live a life that reflects who they are and who, what they value. And that'll change over time. And that's fine. But to find, you know, to wake up in the true midlife crisis is you wake up at 40 or 45 and you realize this is not my beautiful life. This is not my beautiful house. You know, my God, what have I done? Yeah. Um, and you know, you accidentally succeeded into a place that really is a trap. So part of our work with the, you know, people who are a little younger is to help them set up a, a process for themselves where they can kind of keep reinventing the future uh, and but, but base it on the things they actually value rather than just, oh, I, I guess I guess I'll go I'll chase money because money will make me happy. No, there's no evidence in psychology. In fact, there's tons of evidence in psychology that once you have enough money, more money actually makes you uh, uh, has no impact on your happiness and can make you much more miserable. Um, or I'll, I'll chase status. Well, you know, if you look at the, the I don't know if you've um, covered the um, the Harvard study of adult development uh, and the Grant study. This is no. the this is the famous you know eighty five year lo longest longitudinal study of human happiness and development. Started with the Harvard class of nineteen thirty eight, and the last guys are now dying, and they studied them, and it turns out status you know their status in life and, and one of those guys was john kennedy who became president many you know there's supreme court justices and all sorts of you know ceos and everybody in that group wow uh status didn't make them happy money didn't make them happy there was no correlation between that and health there was no correlation between you know um uh, social position uh and all that in terms of you know happiness or feeling like your life was purposeful what, were there any correlations but the number one correlation was um, relationships. Yeah. If you had strong relationships, if you um, had, you know, a, a strong primary relationship with a spouse, if you had a strong, you know, relationships in your community, if you were doing something in your community that was bigger than yourself, you were giving, you know, in, in service to the community or in service to something bigger than yourself, you experienced your life as happy and meaningful. And, and then, by the way, they compared these guys to a bunch of blue collar guys from South Boston who were just, you know, pipe fitters and bricklayers and, and stuff. Exact same results. If you were a member of a, you know, if you, if you belong to a church or a community organization, if you had a strong relationship. So basically happiness comes down to love. Yeah. You know, who do you love wow. and how do you, how do you express yourself and, and your love in the world? So money doesn't matter. All these other things people chase don't matter. I mean, you know, if you don't have enough, that's a different story uh, because now you're, now you're down at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy and you're just scrambling for safety and security. Right. But most of the people we talk to, at least I guess folks who read these kinds of books, you know, they're, they're not, they're not in, they're, they're in okay shape financially, but they're still chasing in some cases the wrong things. And so part of, I think part of what Dave and I do in our office hours in the class and in the book is just like give people permission to look at the facts and go, Oh, I mean, I don't have to, you mean I have enough money? Okay, great. That's not going to, more is not going to make me happy. Oh, that's good to know. What should I be looking for? Well, we don't know. We don't tell anybody. D Dave and I are very big on, we don't should on you. We don't tell you what you should do. <laughs> um, we just say, here's some thing, here's some little experiments you can run. Try this and see what you, see what, see what comes up for you and be honest with yourself. 
you know, uh, but if you if you kind of, most of these people, by the way, who are highly successful, kind of had a sense all along the way that money wasn't working, and that the, the status thing wasn't working, but they never stopped and said, "Wait a minute, before I go down this road too much farther, what's really going on for me?" And if you can just have that kind of, you know, personal honesty or clarity, our experience is things get a lot better. Yeah, wow, this is this is really powerful, Bill. For the listener, for anybody who's been listening for any length of time, you know that I talk about relationships being the number one goal in whatever I coach folks through goal setting. It's we always start with relationships. And and for the listener, if you're interested in my goal setting compass, it's a graphic and the the north pointing north the is, is relationships. You start with number yeah. one is relationships. And once you identify relationship goals and where you want to be there, everything else kind of that, that's your north that's how, how you orient yourself and then everything else kind of orients off of that um, just like a true compass you have to know where, where north is to orient yourself and and then self is next so it's relationships self health and well so in, in self goals are around uh, growth impact and fun so growth impact impact in the community and then and then fun things that that yep. fill you and uh, and another point that that I I, you know, Bill, I interview a lot of amazing people like yourself on this podcast and, and it all comes back to, you know, I I always ask them what kind of habits you do that have helped you be successful. And it all comes back to some form of pause. And actually Tim Ferriss talked about this as well recently, uh, through his new book, but it all comes back to some form of pause, getting off the treadmill of life, whether it's meditation or thinking or coaching or planning or, or reading a book like Designing Your Life. And I, I've, def- I've given it a definition. I call it the productive pause. And, it, and the productive pause is a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. And that's what we're looking for is that clarity of action and the peace of mind. But you have to get off the treadmill first, right? You can't just go along that 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 standard path of life that we're, you know, sort of, I guess, kind of supposed to go along and chase that, yeah. that next rung, like you said, that next golden rung on the ladder, but that is not necessarily, that's not what's going to make you happy. Yeah. And you know, it's not, I mean, again, I'm, we're, we're pulling a lot from positive psychology and other, other things. And we're also, you know, overlaying the design thinking process that we've kind of researched here at Stanford. But if you really step back and look at this stuff, look, I mean, the wisdom traditions of every culture, um, whether in the spiritual or religious world or in, in just the cultural world, there's always been, on, and on the seventh day you rest, there's always been meditation, except those, some of those cultures call that prayer. There's always been this, this, this purposeful pause because life is happening in this ongoing you know, reality every day. And you get, you get caught up in it and then it's just problem solving and, you know, getting the kids to daycare or, or picking up the kids from soccer. And, and you don't have a lot of there's no structure in our in our daily lives that, that give us a place to stop and go, um, OK, how's it working for me right now? Or how's it working for me in general? And um, you really want to be able, you know, to take that time um, and, you know, and 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 think about it and. You know, so we talk in the book about you, you got to have some to support a healthy, you know, life design. You got to have some practices. Maybe it's journaling, if that's what you like to do. Maybe it is, you know, mindfulness and meditation. We um, we don't we don't push that necessarily other than to say, hey, you know, do something that allows you to step away from, you know, the, the, the daily flow and, um, you know, and. and Think a little bit. Here's some structured ways of thinking about the question. How's it going? Um, and we got we got we got one nice comment back from a, a, a reader who said, "Well, at least you're not talking about mindfulness because I am so sick and tired <laughs> of every book I'm talking about mindfulness. Like I want to be mindful." And but it's not that. It's just you know every wisdom tradition for the the the, the five thousand years of recorded history um, has a has something in it that says. Hey, we get so wrapped up in our day to day thing. It's a great idea to have what you're, what you're calling a purposeful pause. Yeah. And whatever your practice is, do it, you know, and, 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 and make it important. Don't, don't forget to do it. Yeah. Bill, you've had tremendous success in your life. Your, you know, best selling book, Stanford graduate twice, um, all these patents, all this success in your life. 
and this may be a silly question to ask a designer, but <laughs> have you failed? Can, and can you share with us a time when you failed? And, and maybe where that failure caused doubt, um, maybe even that sense of hopelessness that comes with that, and how were you able to move through that? Oh, you know, sure. I mean, uh, one of the things that's true about signing up, you know, for a life of being a designer is you're always doing stuff you've never done before. And so you fail a lot. I mean, I can, I can think of lots of projects and things like that that were failures, but I've been an entrepreneur, um, three times, uh, twice where I've been the guy raising the money and trying to put the thing together. And I would say that, you know, one of the, one of the biggest the last company I did was, uh, you know, we started it, we raised, you know, five or six or seven million dollars. And then we um, and then we just discovered that what we were doing, there was no market and it, and it was kind of, you know, and, and it was a failure and we ended up closing the company. And the reason, you know, and I, I, I point to that one because it felt to me like, wow, I've done this before. I should have like and I teach design why didn't i see that nobody wanted the thing we were making you know and it's just this it's this amazing thing where you get so caught up in your own ideas that you know you 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 stop to ask really simple questions like hey let me before before we you know spend another five million dollars on this thing let's go find out you know what people really think and so that was a that was a pretty big failure both financially for for the people who backed us but also for me personally because it it was the one time I've done something where I felt like I was way out of my own process. You know, my yeah, own process yeah. would say, do this in small steps. Don't go for the big thing. And I think what happened is I got caught up in, I got caught up in this, the story. Hey, I'm a startup guy. I'm raising lots of money. You know, there's, there's a little, there's a thing here in Silicon Valley where people talk about how much money they've raised, <laughs> not how much value they've created. Sure. And, um, you know, so everybody is susceptible to culture. And I, I found myself and then, and then I got really down on myself about, well, come on, you know better than that. And you, you teach this stuff. What's the matter with you? You shouldn't you shouldn't have let that happen. Um, but, you know, like uh, you, you talked about, you know, failure in your in your TED talk. It's like, well. You just, you know, one, I got mad at myself and then and then two, uh, because because I ended up, you know, hiring a bunch of people I really respect and admire. We worked on this thing for two or three years and then I ended up having to you know lay everybody off and send them home. I, I had actually damaged, you know, some relationships and I had actually, you know, some people who were counting on, you know, having a job didn't have one. And so there were real consequences to my you know, egotistical behavior of thinking my idea was so great I didn't have to check with the world first. Right. Um, so I think you go through a period of this. I go through a period of, you know, blaming myself being really down on myself being really hard on myself, caring about the, the negative consequence I created for other people, because, it, you know, if this had just been my own thing, it would be one thing to fail. But if a bunch of other people, you know, were on the ride, too. Um, and then you and then, you know, that, that that takes some time. And then you step back and you go, oh, wait a minute. I, you know, let's go back to my process. I do understand that. Um, if you're going to try to do innovation, you will fail more often than you succeed. That's just the rule. There's no other way around it. So what can I learn from this? And, um, you know, and, and that was that was a really that was a really productive experience. And, it, you know, it's taken it's taken us, you know, then 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 I'm, I joined Stanford. I do some other things. Um, and then the opportunity to do this book comes along. And now um you know, kind of the, I, I guess I'm thinking of the book as my last startup in a way, right? I'll put some ideas in the world and see what happens. And, and uh, that has vastly exceeded, you know, my expectations and Dave ex, Dave's expectations. We knew the class was successful. But we didn't really know if you could capture everything in a book. And in fact, the very first version of the book, which we threw away, um, which would be, I guess, another failure, it was I, we we have 10 weeks and in Stanford, you know, a Stanford quarter is 10 weeks long. So we have 10 weeks of, of you know, ex exercises. So I simply dictated into some speech software 10 weeks worth of lectures and exercises. And when we looked at that, we said, this is this is terrible. <laughs> no one, there's nothing worse than a lecture other than reading someone's lecture, which is probably you know even worse. Uh, and so, um, and it felt pretentious and it felt preachy and it was a lot of should. 
And so and at that point, Dave and I said, okay, well, we don't know what the hell we're doing. And we went and found a really great, um, uh, a really great book agent who also happens to be a great writer and had some other writers on staff that could kind of help us understand how to do this. So that was enough. I guess that's enough. We threw, we threw away the entire book, uh, at least once. And then of course edited the book that, that ended up coming out, you know, dozens and dozens of times, but there was one complete false start in this process. Um, and that's okay because you know, then, then in that case it was like, well, I've never, I've never written a book before. And so the first one I write is probably going to, you know, I should probably should have planned to throw it away. Um, it just kind of turned out that way. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I, you know, I, I talk, we talk about failure immunity in the book. It's, it's when you're, when you're experimenting, you're not really failing. Even when the experiment doesn't get the result you were looking for, because what happens in that case is that just means you had the wrong assumptions or you had the wrong, you know, you, you, you thought something was connected and it's not. So yeah, although it's a failure, it's all about, you know, it's about learning. It's about resilience. It's about coming back and trying again with a new hypothesis or a new point of view. Um, so I'm, I'm all in favor of, you know, the, the, the thing you're, you know, your Ted talk was on, um, I was, a I wasn't uh, in, in college, but I was a competitive um, gymnast in high school. And, you know, gymnastics, uh, I think kind of like wrestling is one, a, a little bit different than wrestling in that you just compete against yourself. You know, you, sure. there's no one on the apparatus trying to push you off, <laughs> Yeah, which would, which would kind of be a weird version of gymnastics. <laughs> we should invent that. That could be um, great. We could, uh, we could test it. Yeah. Two guys on a high bar, each trying to kick each other off. Um, <laughs> But it, but it is very much that thing where it is entirely your own personal effort, right, that makes you better. And you fall off a lot. And you fail a lot. And, and having, and I had great coaches in my high school um, who really, really knew not only how to teach us you know, gymnastics, but how to motivate us to, to get to that next level. Um, and so, you know, having that, you know, having those early experiences, I, I mean, I was a, I was a pretty nerdy kid. I was kind of a, you know, math and science weirdo and, until, uh, in a gym class, a coach said, Hey, you seem to be pretty good at this. I want you to come try out for the team. And then I, I never thought of myself as an athlete and then ended up, you know, uh, doing competitive gymnastics. And we happen to have a, a gymnastics team. I grew up in the outside of Boston in a town called Burlington, Massachusetts. And we happened to be either number one or number two or three in the state every year. We wow. had a pr good program. So, you know, the, I, I really related to stuff you're talking about, you know, it's like freshman year going to the, the, to the big, you know, state tournament and just falling, just like falling off my, you know, my apparatus and the second year doing a little better and the third year doing, you know, a little better. And, and finally getting, you know, kind of getting to the level that you, you, you know, had no idea you could get to. Right. But having that kind of resilience and coaching and people who believe in you, it's, it's, it's just so important. And for the listener, you heard it here first, Bill and I are going to prototype, uh, gymnastling <laughs> gymnastics and we're going to prototype that and see if this design That's, thinking you know, stuff really you know, works. <laughs> it's a great idea. It could be the new martial, you know, mixed martial arts. It could be, it could be, let's go start raising money for it right now for the mm -hmm. new league. <laughs> so for the listener, I also want to address that, you know, Bill shared something very personal, you know, it's, it's, it's a simple story to tell on a podcast, but this was a real experience in raising this money and starting this business and, and really investing time and energy and money and, and oh, yeah. it failed. And like you said, there were ripple effects in other people's lives and whatnot. And I want the listener to understand that, that we're talking to an expert and every expert that I bring on here, some these people that I, we bring on the show are, are, are elite performers at what they do. And they always share a story of failure. So, so for you, when you fail, when you struggle, when you have adversity and setbacks, realize this is a normal part. This is the normal part of life. This is a normal part of success. And however you define success. So this is part of your path. And Bill, my, my listeners like to get action items out of these episodes. If the listener is saying, sitting there saying, you know, I'm in, I, I, I like this idea. What's my first step outside of buying the book? And I'm going to recommend that. Like I said, I'll have a link to the yeah. book in, uh, in the action plan, jimharshawjr.com slash 
action. Uh, and also for the listener, I have a couple notes here. I'm going to also I'm going to look for a Google link to or a link to that Harvard study, uh, yeah. as well as I'm going to have a link to my my uh, goal setting compass, which has the relationships as the true north. You can print that out and post it on your wall. But what would be an action item that the listener can do in the next 24 to 48 hours to start moving towards this using this design thinking in their lives? Yeah, you know, I said I don't like, I don't like uh, self help books that have some simplified formula, but I'll give you a simplified formula that that actually just works because it's just a it's just you know kind of a a good way to get started. Um, curiosity is one of the mindset of a designer. You you got to be curious about the world. You want to be curious about well, why does this work this way, or how, how could I make this better? Right. So um, find something you're curious about. If anything, uh, I'm curious about um, you know. Uh, does anybody do an HO rate, uh, HO, you know, trains anymore? And anybody doing, you know, um, uh, getting their radio operators license and learning Morse code, what, whatever you're curious about, get curious about something today, something that's on your list. And, you know, if you've got a journal or something, pick something, then within the next 24 hours, you know, your prototype challenges, find somebody who knows something about that and, sit down and have a cup of coffee with them or, or talk to them over Skype. So get curious, meet some, and talk to somebody. And then from that encounter, invent the next step, whatever the next step is trying something or giving another conversation. By the way, that, that the power question and after a prototype interview is, Hey, this has been so interesting, Jim. And, and now that, um, now that I know about this, I'm really even more curious. Is there anybody else you think, you know, who, you know, if you were me, who else should I talk to? And and the critical phrase is if you were me, because as soon as someone hears if you were yeah. me, they they think, oh, I could put myself in your situation. And their empathy, you know, neurons light up, and now all of a sudden they're out of their judgment brain and they're into their empathy brain, and they're and they're and they give you the gift of helping you on your journey, which makes them feel good. They do it for a selfish reason. Sure. It makes them feel good. Um, and, and this empathy thing really works. So I'd say, get curious, talk to somebody and then go try something based on that experience. And you can execute all that in the next 24 to 48 hours. People are surprisingly available when you approach them with the energy of your curiosity. Yeah, absolutely. Bill, there's so much great stuff to take from this episode for the listener. You may have to listen to this a second time. Certainly (laughs) grab the action plan, jimharshawjr.com slash action Bill, where can people find you, follow you, learn about what you're doing, et cetera? Anything on so other social media and or websites, et cetera? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we we're, uh, I would go to our website first where we have all, all, all of the exercises and everything in the book are there. You can just download them for free. If you don't want to buy the book, just, you know, download the exercises and, and do them. Um, and it's at designing your dot life. So the, the, you know, the dot com is dot life. And so designing your dot life life at www will get you to the website and that'll get you to um also uh, click over to we have a facebook page um it's just um designing your life the book um so you can find that on facebook that's where every now we've got about six or seven hundred book clubs around the country we, we we encourage people to make little design teams and do this together so people are buying the book and they're getting three or four of their friends together and they're going through the exercises and on the on the facebook page they're posting little videos of their clubs or their or their activities they're showing us their prototypes it's really it's a kind of a fun community so designing your life the book on facebook and designing your dot life designing your dot life would be the two resources to go to and from there you can you know there's there's a coaches page on the Facebook page of coaches that are using this in their coaching practice. There's, um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to be teaching a bunch of different workshops, um, this summer around the Bay area, maybe even back East. And so you can find out about those on the website. Fantastic for the listener. I have links to everything Bill just said there in the action plan. I'm also going to have a link bill to your 2017 Stanford TEDx talk, which is just fascinating. Uh, really talks about a lot of, uh, a lot of things that we just talked about here and, uh, puts a video element to it. Bill, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Oh, you're welcome. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for having me. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. Mm-hmm.